Beginning in May of 1965, a strange new plane could be seen in the skies around Montreal. It flew like an airplane, but could take off and land like a helicopter. Its amazing capabilities caught the eye and amazed crowds wherever it went. It was the Canadair CL-84 Dynavert, Canada's second attempt at a vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. Although it had its first flight in the mid-1960s, the design work and wind tunnel testing that shaped the final airframe was initiated in 1954. This was just two years after the initiation of the Avro Car project, when enthusiasm for VTOL aircraft within the industry was still high. Designers had applied the lessons learned by many preceding foreign projects and set out to produce an aircraft that would overcome the two major failings of other designs. At the core of the project, they wanted to concentrate on solid aerodynamics and an easy-to-operate power control structure. Canadair envisioned a sturdy transport aircraft which would satisfy several tactical roles at once. These included military transport, troop support, reconnaissance, search and rescue, and fleet support, as well as some anti-submarine warfare. The ideal size, shape, and power plant of the 84 was selected through extensive design studies that explored a wide range of VTOL techniques. Chief designers Carlos Urbatus and Frederick C. Phillips joined forces at Canadair to undertake a comprehensive design study into short and vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. Phillips had previously led the engineering team to produce Canadair's first in-house aircraft, the CL-41 Tudor Jet Trainer. Now he led the team in producing their second in-house design. Between 1956 and 1959, the first phase of the CL-62 V-STAL series was developed to meet a U.S. Army requirement for a V-STAL aircraft capable of carrying 2,268 kilograms over a range of 400 kilometers. Canadair initiated studies of five aircraft layouts which would each take advantage of a unique VTOL concept. The first four would have a common fuselage and a high wing to facilitate the design process, while the fifth design would have a unique configuration. The CL-62-1 was a slipstream deflection stall variant, which emphasized large propeller diameter and an extensive trailing edge flap system. A tail rotor situated on top the cruciform tail provided pitch control during low speed operation. The CL-62-2 was a tilt wing VTOL capable variant, which had a swing wing mounting four nacelles with cross shafted 2000 horsepower engines. It too had a tail rotor mounted on top the tail for pitch control during low speed operations, as well as in the hover. It would take advantage of slipstream deflection during the transition from vertical to horizontal flight by extending leading and trailing edge flaps. The CL62-3 had a tilting ducted fan. This design had the added benefit of additional wing area provided by the ducting. Deflector vanes inside the ducts could provide reliable direction control while keeping turbulence over the wing to a minimum. Four 2,500 horsepower engines mounted forward of the wing route were connected to shafts powering the eight bladed fans. The CL62-4 was a jet lift turboprop combination. The turboprops would be used in the transition and at horizontal flight. The 16 General Electric J85 turbojet engines mounted along the side fairings of the fuselage would be used for hover and in transitions. They would then shut down during horizontal flight. The extreme noise levels associated with this layout made it highly unlikely to be successful. The CL62-5 turbojet lift propulsive wing variant was the most extreme. It had 14 turbojet engines mounted in the trailing edge of the wing. They would swing down during VTOL operation. An additional three engines mounted in the nose gear would provide pitch control. Its uniquely sleek design was a result of its projected high speed and high altitude flight. The hot exhaust gases under the jet during landings made operations difficult and dangerous, so it was highly unlikely to be successful as well. In December of 1959, the CL62-6 large tilt wing variant was offered as the culmination of the phase one design studies. It was large enough to replace the Caribou Transport and the Chinook Helicopter, and it was essentially a refinement of the CL62-2. 
It sported larger 2,650 horsepower engines and revised aerodynamics including mounting the tail rotor below the tail surface. The tilt wing deflected slipstream approach was selected as the most promising layout from the Phase 1 studies. In 1959, Phase 2 of the CL62 series began to optimize the configuration. Two variants were explored. Both had similar size and fuselage design to the CL62-6 but with revised aerodynamics. The CL62A had four engines turning four smaller propellers, while the CL62B had four engines turning two larger propellers. Test rigs were developed to explore both variations. It was found that the four-engine combination had problems with wing flexing and vibrations caused by the cross-shafting of the engines through the wings. The two-engine configuration was less problematic and showed equal performance. One major difference was the angle of the wing during conventional landings. The 62B would have to keep its wings at a minimum of 15 degrees tilt to provide clearance for the propellers. In 1961, and in response to another NATO requirement, the CL62C was the culmination of the Phase II design studies for a large VTOL transport. Although the design was shortlisted, the requirement was cancelled by NATO and further development of four propeller designs was abandoned. The smaller two propeller VTOL concepts showed more promise. In 1961, Canadair teamed up with the American McDonald Company to produce the Model 175 based on Canadair's Phase II design studies. It was competing for a potentially lucrative contract with the American Tri-Service Military. Unfortunately, the competition was won by the LTV XC-142, and the partnership was dissolved. The LTV XC-142 was similar in size and configuration to the CL-62-6. Five prototypes were built in 1964 and tested until 1970. The design suffered from intense vibrations due to the cross-shafting of the four engine nacelles through the large wings. The wing flexing problem that doomed the American project was identified by Canadair engineers in the design of the CL-62A, and thus only two nacelle designs were pursued. The two other designs of note were the CL-73 and the CL-74. Both were offered up in 1958. The CL-73 was designed as a light observation aircraft capable of working from rough field conditions. It was originally intended to be a test aircraft for research into VTOL transitions. Several scale models were built to explore the aerodynamics, but no prototypes were built. The CL-74 was a more commercial design, intended to fulfill civilian and military light transport roles. The design was never pursued beyond the basic outlining stage. On January 31, 1963, the Canadian government sponsored a contract to develop the CL-84 light VTOL tilt-wing aircraft. This first version of the 84 was built on the CL-73 concept, but slightly larger. It was promoted as a military aircraft for emergency transport, artillery field control, ground support, and casualty evacuations, but it also had civilian applications. These included using it as a bush plane in the Arctic, or as a short-haul commuter aircraft in and around urban centers. The wings were 9.5 meters long and supported two cross-shafted 500 horsepower engines. They drove two four-bladed propellers whose diameter was 4.3 meters. The design retained a tail rotor at the end of its 10.1 meter long, 3.3 meter tall airframe. Tests were carried out using powered scale models on test rigs and in wind tunnels. Two prototypes were ordered but were cancelled before production could commence due to last minute changes in the design. After reviewing their operational needs, the Canadian government wanted more cargo and troop carrying capability from the small aircraft, as well as a large rear facing cargo door. These changes necessitated larger engines and so the Lycoming T-53, rated at 1000 horsepower, was selected and the design was revised accordingly. The CL-84's second and final operational concept was the culmination of all previous research and design studies. It was tailored to the US military market and meant to fulfill many roles. These included tactical assault transport and casualty evacuation, reconnaissance and surveillance, search and rescue, aircraft carrier liaison, 
anti-submarine warfare, armed helicopter escort, and close air support. Canadair also envisioned the 84 to have many commercial applications, including surveying, remote northern transport, air ambulance, and short-haul passenger transport between urban centers. By August of 1963, they had settled on a design, and a prototype was produced at the Canadair plant in Montreal. After two years of extensive systems testing and troubleshooting, it would have its first flight on May 7, 1965. Its first transition from hover to forward flight and back again was performed almost a year later, in 1966, once engineers and pilots were comfortable with the design. The CL-84 was 14.4 meters in length, had a height of 4.3 meters, and a wingspan of 10.1 meters. It weighed 3,402 kilograms when empty, and 5,594 kilograms when fully loaded for a VTOL mission. It was powered by two Lycoming Model T-53 turboprop engines. The 1,400 horsepower engines each turned a four-bladed variable pitch propeller whose diameter was 4.2 meters. An assembly of cams and drive shafts allowed easy and reliable power transfer between the engines. This was a significant safety feature as it would allow both propellers to maintain power in the event of a single engine failure. The wings could be tilted through 90 degrees by a mechanism joining the wings to the fuselage. The propeller's large diameter meant that the entire wing surface would remain in the slipstream at any given wing angle. The tailwing was located below the level of the wing to ensure that it too was in the slipstream at all modes of flight. It was tilted through 45 degrees during the transition from vertical to horizontal flight. The system maintained the nose attitude and added lift during critical phases of the transition. The 84 had an ingenious control structure linking the propeller pitch angle, elevators, rudder, ailerons, and engine power together in an almost fully conventional cockpit. The only addition was a single lever that controlled the angle of the wing relative to the fuselage. The deflection angle of the tail wing as well as the flaps and leading edge flaps of the main wing were controlled by a hybrid 16-bit digital analog flight computer designed solely for this purpose. It would be fine-tuned as time went on through extensive computer and wind tunnel testing to reduce the pilot workload in low-speed flight conditions. While in forward flight, the controls were that of a standard aircraft. The gear mixing box as well as the flight computer automatically adapted the controls when transitioning to a hover. Once in hover, the pedals used for yaw control switched from controlling the rudder to controlling the ailerons. Differential power to the engines and propeller pitch angle were used for roll control in a hover instead of the ailerons. A set of counter-rotating blades located at the rear of the fuselage took over for pitch control from the elevators. When in forward flight, these propellers were shut down to lessen drag. And finally, power to the engines determined the altitude while in a hover. The 84 had a cruising speed of 507 km per hour, and a maximum speed of 531 km per hour. The 84's top speed was limited by the size of the propeller blades. Increasing the rotor speed caused the tips of the blades to approach the dangerous shear forces caused by breaking the sound barrier. The 84 had a very good rate of climb for a propeller-driven aircraft of 1,280 meters per minute due to its configuration. The plane could be loaded with 675 kilograms of cargo for a pure VTOL mission, and that could be increased to 1,620 kilograms in a short takeoff or conventional mission with a full fuel load. It was also found that thanks to slipstream deflection from the main wing, a 65 km per hour headwind could double the 84's VTOL payload. The initial series of 300 hours of tests were conducted successfully. The aircraft's full flight regime was explored from vertical takeoff to horizontal flight under a wide range of environmental conditions. The prototype experienced a hard landing in June of 1966, which collapsed the landing gear and broke the propeller blades. The damage was repaired and the prototype began test flights again.
The conventional style cockpit controls and natural control movements needed to operate the Dynavert meant that no special training was required before pilots could take flight. By the end of testing, the 84 was flown by pilots from the Canadian Armed Forces, the Royal Air Force, the US Navy, and NASA. They all reported it to have excellent handling qualities. The mission profile of the aircraft was expanded to include search and rescue with the addition of a winch at the rear of the cargo bay. It could perform rescue missions from a hover over both water and in later tests over land simulating the jungles of Southeast Asia. Unfortunately, in September 1967, while flying at 280 km per hour in the forward flight mode, the failure of the pitch angle controller in the propeller assembly caused the first prototype to crash without casualty. Both pilots ejected safely. It had been flown on 305 test flights for over two years by 16 pilots before the failure. Three more Dynaverts were manufactured by Canadair Limited of Montreal in 1969. They were needed as part of a marketing campaign to promote the capabilities of the aircraft and secure future sales. A large number of improvements over the first prototype were integrated into the new airframes. These included more powerful engines and improved hydraulic and safety systems, as well as many others. Its main competitor for the VTOL transport role was the UH-1D Iroquois. The 84 was superior in all respects. While the two had similar ranges, the 84 was much faster and could carry a larger payload. Even with the 84's obvious performance advantages over the Iroquois, over 16,000 of the latter would be built between 1956 and 1987. The helicopter had established itself as the dominant VTOL design in the minds of the public and military planners. In an effort to prove the design, the second prototype began flight testing with the Canadian Armed Forces and the US Navy starting in 1969. Demonstration flights proceeded well until a gearbox failure in 1973 destroyed the second prototype, but saved the two pilots who ejected safely. It was rumored that the two U.S. Navy pilots were trying to set an unauthorized power climb record and overly stressed the system. The third prototype didn't fly until September of 1972, when demonstration flights involving Canada, the U.S. and the U.K. began in Montreal. By the beginning of 1973, they had moved to bases in Maryland, on the east coast of the United States. There, the aircraft would take part in 196 test flights demonstrating the full range of the aircraft's capabilities. These included 169 flying hours of conversions under blind flying conditions, endurance and performance evaluations, sling load tests, simulated rescues from hover, and dropping of external stores. The second batch of prototypes had two hard points under the fuselage to accommodate external stores, such as extra fuel tanks or weapon pods. These tanks greatly extended the range of the 84. As part of the tests, the Dynavert would perform marine operations flying off American helicopter carriers. Many successful landings and takeoffs were carried out under various weather conditions off the USS Guam and USS Guadalcanal. The tests were all successful and were carried out by a pilot with no previous carrier experience. Weapons testing was also carried out by equipping the 84 with a General Electric 7.62mm minigun pod. The tests were successful and the Dynaver proved to be a stable and accurate gun platform. The fourth prototype was used for display purposes and was never flown. It continues to be on display, now with the National Aviation Museum in Ottawa. Although the aircraft was demonstrated to the militaries of Canada, the US, the UK, West Germany, and the Netherlands, 
Canadair was unable to secure any sales of the aircraft. Unfortunately, the capabilities of the 84 were seen as largely incompatible with their current battle strategy, and so they could not easily incorporate the aircraft into their inventories. A sale to the Americans would have changed the Dynavert's fortunes. Their incorporation of the technology would have set a standard for most NATO countries, but they were hesitant to commit to the project. The war in Vietnam was winding down and the budget for military projects and procurement was being curtailed. The original U.S. requirement for a VTOL transport had been cancelled along with the XC-142. Another consideration that doomed the Canadian Dynavert program as far as sales to the Americans was the not made in America factor. With few exceptions, the American military preferred to buy from their own local industry. The Canadian transport was seen as a threat to that industry and so they favored the less successful American projects. However, all these projects were cancelled before production could commence. VTOL aircraft flying in a role similar to that envisioned for the CL-84 wouldn't be deployed until 2007 when the US Marines began flying the V-22 Osprey. With no interest from the Canadian government and foreign sales doubtful, the Dynavert program was finally cancelled in 1974. The highly successful program lasted almost 20 years but only produced four aircraft, two of which crashed. Although the workers at Canadair knew they had a world beater on their hands, the technology and its potential wasn't a fit for its time. Canadair's Dynavert program demonstrated to the world that Canada was a major player in the global race for new technology. Their approach emphasized aerodynamic innovation and a willingness to experiment with promising, yet previously untested concepts. The Canadian aerospace industry, including both Avro and Canadair, would continue this tradition throughout the Cold War years and produce some of the finest aircraft our country had to offer.